Hi, I'm Ted Morrissey, and this is a video for my experimental writing course in uh, Linda Wood University's MFA in Writing program. We have uh, looked at a, a group of stories in the uh, Bax 2020 anthology. That's the best American experimental writing anthology. And um, as you know, uh, my method to my madness is that uh, each week we're kind of going farther and farther out on the experimental limb. So the first group of stories that we looked at were, were fairly traditional in a lot of ways. Um, and so their experimentation was, you know, at, at sort of a minimum. Uh, but then this next group that we just looked at, kind of medium, I guess, me medium heat in terms of experimentation. And then, of course, uh, next week, as you can imagine, we're getting into the, the really, really kind of out there stuff. Um, in the other video that I'm going to uh, give you a link to, it's the video I made the last time I taught this course, and it speaks to this group of readings uh, more uh, expressly and particularly looks at them in the context of being uh, based in trauma. You know, I think each of the pieces, um, you know, some expressly so, others, you know, more implied, um, deal with trauma or are rooted in trauma. And so, um, like I said, that video speaks more to that. So if that's something you, you want to uh, partake of and, and, and you know, look at that a little more closely, I certainly encourage that. But I wanted to uh, go a little bit different route um, and look at some things that this guy, William Gass, has to say about um, writing in general. But um, since he was very much uh, experimental in his approach, um, his thoughts on writing certainly are in, um, you know, in harmony with what we are thinking about and talking about uh, during this course, right? And uh, the two things I really want to kind of focus on are uh, what he has to say about character um, and then also um, about process. And let me maybe kind of start with that actually in the sense that um, I think um, it's important to consider process because I think with a lot of these pieces we're looking at and this is certainly true of the group we looked at this past week that is so you know connected to the, the trauma of the writers is that the the pieces tend to grow out of, of the subject matter you know we've been talking about the the sort of uh, tried and true a traditional Aristotelian approach to narrative uh, that that we all come to know so well as writers, uh, either just because we, we we read it so much, but then also when we start uh, studying to become a writer, oftentimes that's the model, and by oftentimes I mean nearly all of the time, that's the model that is preached to us to follow, uh, because it is effective, obviously, in many ways. But that model in itself tends to encourage certain kinds of, of subjects, certain styles of, of storytelling. Whereas if you remove that model and you let the subject matter itself sort of dictate the, the, the narrative structure, then we're getting into you know, this area that we, that we are studying, this more experimental sort of non-traditional, non-orthodox, unorthodox uh, you know, kind of narrative, right? So that's kind of where I'm headed. But let's, again, like I said, let's start with um, some things that uh, the gas uh, had to say about uh, characterization and then also about the process. And again, I'm pulling from a couple of different sources, um, conversations with William H. Gass, I've mentioned before. This is a great book. Um, it's a compilation of uh, various interviews that he did over about 30 years or so. And uh, this is just actually um, a sampling of them. He was a very generous uh, grantor of interviews and always had really interesting things to say. So you can find uh, other interviews online that aren't in this book uh, that, again, are very illuminating. Uh, you can find video interviews of gas uh, to listen to, which and watch and listen to, that are also uh, really interesting if you're a writerly sort, as we all are. So um, his interviews are very uh, informative and, and, and give us a lot to think about across the spectrum of, of writing-related things. So I do want to draw from conversations with William H. Gas, edited by Theodore G. Ammon. And then also a little bit from this book, 
fiction and the figures of life. This is a Gas's first uh, nonfiction collection. It was originally published in 1970. And um, it's a collection of uh, reviews, essays, uh, etc., that he wrote uh, for different uh, purposes and then kind of all brought together in this in this uh, volume. He actually published a lot more nonfiction uh, than he did fiction, partly because it took him so long to write his fiction. Uh, and one of the reasons that it took him so long to write his fiction was because he was often kind of pulled away from it to write reviews and to write essays and to give lectures and talks here and there, uh, which, as he as he said, you know, paid the bills much, much uh, better than his fiction, which hardly made him any money at all. So being a, uh, you know, a, a a husband and father with the kids to raise. Uh, he was inclined to take the paying gigs uh, more often than not. And so uh, that would uh, often take him away from his fiction writing. But the, uh, I guess the, the silver lining in all that is that we have several collections of his uh, essays and reviews and talks and so forth that we can, we can now, you know, read at our leisure and, and really draw from. So, so let me start with, um, with fiction and the figures of life. And again, this is a, a book that a lot of writers have read. Um, we know, for example, that Cormac McCarthy read uh, Fiction and the Figures of Life pretty early in his career and that he uh, admired what it had to say and drew from it and just, just one of many writers in that boat. But again, I want to, uh, I want to uh, take a couple of things from uh, one of the first pieces in here, which is um, the concept of character in fiction. And um, I'll just kind of read here and there and then expand a little bit on that. But Gass writes, A great character has an endless interest. Its fascination never wanes. Indeed, it is a commonplace to say so. Hamlet, Ahab, Julian Sorrel, Madame Bovary. There is no end to their tragedy. Great literature is great because its characters are great, and characters are great when they are memorable. A simple formula. The true Danish ghost Christ, remember him and obediently, for we are gullible and superstitious clots, we do. And so um, he does acknowledge the importance of characters, right? He goes on to uh, talk about some other highly memorable characters from literature, Huckleberry Finn, um, Pickwick, Molly Bloom, etc. But then he goes on to say, however... Aristotle's remark, I remember last week we looked at uh, Aristotle's poetics and where we get a lot of the concepts or pretty much all the concepts that we still follow in, in constructing narrative. However, Aristotle's remark was a recommendation. Characters ought to exist for the sake of the action, he thought, though he knew they often did not. And those who nowadays say that given a sufficiently powerful and significant plot, the characters will be dominated by it are simply answered by asking them to imagine the plot of Moby Dick in the hand, hands of Henry James or that of Sanctuary done into Austin. So um, on the one hand, Gass recognizes the importance of characterization, but um, he questions Aristotle's placing it so high on the, the list of priorities for the, the fiction writer. But he goes on to discuss the fact that that uh, characters don't have to be um, people. We tend to think of them as such. We tend to think of characters in fiction as people, uh, and if not people, personified animals, perhaps, as in you know, George Orwell's Animal Farm or Watership Down or what have you. But um, but he says that that in fiction, um, anything can be a character. That a a Inanimate object can be a character. And indeed, one of the stories uh, Gass wrote, uh, the character was a chair sitting in a barber shop and kind of telling its story. Another story that Gass wrote was about the piano in the bar in Casablanca. Uh, play it again, Sam, you know, that piano, right? And so he tells the story from the piano's perspective. So, so inanimate objects can be characters, but also so can ideas. And so a work of fiction can develop the characterization uh, 
of an idea or a symbol as much as it can a human character who goes through some, you know, revelatory change, you know, a la Ebenezer Scrooge or what have you. And I think this is where um, Gas is particularly um, revelatory in this way that he um, that he gives us this to think about. He says, um, "Let me let me go here." Um, but there are some points in a narrative which remain relatively fixed. We may depart from them, but soon we return as music returns to its theme. Characters are those primary substances to which everything else is attached. Hotels, dresses, conversations, sausage, feelings, gestures, snowy evenings, faces, each may fade as fast as we read them, yet the language of the novel will eddy about a certain incident or name as Melville's always train passing, always circles back to Ahab and his wedding with the white whale. Mountains are characters in Malcolm Lowry's Under the Volcano. So is a ravine, a movie, mescal, or a boxing poster. A symbol like the cross can be a character, an idea or a situation. The Antichrist and the secret agent, um, bomb ready in his pocket. The anarchist, rather, uh, and the secret agent. Or a particular event, an obsessive thought, a decision, Zenos, for instance, to quit smoking, a passion, a memory, the weather, Gogol's overcoat, anything indeed which serves as a fixed point like a stone in a stream or that soap in Bloom's pocket functions as a character. Character in this sense is a matter of degree, for the language of the novel may loop back seldom, often, or incessantly. But the idea that characters are like primary substances has to be taken in a double way. Because if anything becomes a character simply to the degree the words of the novel qualify it, it also loses some of its substance, some of its primacy, to the extent that it in turn qualifies something else. In a perfectly organized novel, every word would ultimately qualify one thing. All right. So, um, so let me just kind of step back a second here. So, what Gas is suggesting is that uh, anything potentially could be a character in a short story or a novel, any kind of narrative, right? Um, again, we tend to think of human beings as characters, and certainly that is the vast majority of them. Uh, but objects, ideas, symbols, and so forth can also be characters around which a narrative is constructed, okay? So that, that's something to think about. I believe. Um, and as we kind of go forward in our reading of, of uh, so-called experimental literature, think about whether the stories we're encountering have traditional, probably human or at least animal characters, or are they something else? Is the story kind of pivoting around some other thing besides a human or, or nearly human kind of being? All right. So that's one thought. And then that um, leads us uh, to what I want to talk about to, to finish this conversation, which is uh, the writing process, right? And um, I know we've talked a little bit about it uh, via the discussion board and some of the announcement uh, conversations we've been having and so forth. And, um, you know, I think a, a couple of you have talked about uh, your rather organic process uh, of writing, and I, too, uh, adhere to that idea. Um, but I want to really, really stress Gass's ideas here about letting the narrative kind of evolve with the story, the, the, the structure and style of the narrative, as opposed to trying to um, find a form first and then fit some sort of story into that form, right? Um, and then I'll begin here with uh, a, a quote that I kind of quoted, somewhat paraphrased on the discussion board uh, within the last few days. He says, um, and this is from a 1976 interview with Thomas LeClaire. I think this is the Paris Review. Yeah, this is the Paris Review, the Art of Fiction interview, again from 1976. But he says, uh, a lot of modern writers, I remember saying, are writing for the fast mind that speeds over the text like those noisy bastards in motorboats. The connections are all spatial 
and all at various complicated intellectual levels, they stand to literature as fast food to food. All right. So um, again, a lot of, uh, he says, modern writers, and of course he's talking in the 70s, I think it's uh, escalated to being even more true today in 2022. But a lot of writers um, that we'll encounter in Barnes and Noble and on the front you know, screen, the first page of Amazon or however you want to say it, are writers who are writing for the fast mind. They're writing for people who, as readers, want to sort of, you know, uh, speed their way through the text, getting sort of the gist of it and not really being bogged down in uh, complicated ideas and trying to figure out what's going on in the narrative and so forth. Whereas, Writers of Gas's ilk, and I think certainly the writers that we are encountering in this course, that's not the sort of reader they're appealing to. They are appealing to readers who want to be challenged, who want to slow down, think about what the writer is saying, how they're saying it, extrapolate all kinds of, of inferences and, and meanings from it themselves, and so on. And they don't want a quick fast, superficial read. And so in these experimental pieces that are oftentimes confusing upon, upon a first reading or maybe a, a 15th reading, um, that is part of their strategy is to slow us down, to make us think about, well, why is this represented this way on the page? What is the writer saying here? You know, so forth and so on. And so um, that's the, the first uh uh, point that I wanted to kind of underscore gases. He goes on to say that um, he talks a lot about uh, about the reader and uh, the interviewer asks, is the reader an adversary for you? In other words, are you kind of challenging the reader? And Gas says, no, I don't think much about the reader. Ways of reading are adversaries, those theoretical ways. As far as writing something is concerned, the reader really doesn't exist. The writer's business is somehow to create in the work something which will stand on its own and make its own demands. And if the writer is good, he discovers what those demands are and he meets them and creates this thing which readers can do, then do what they like with. So again, um, so much of the time in, in writing courses, uh, we are told to consider our audience and to know our audience and to tailor our message to, to the audience. Fiction writers, uh, at least the sort of, of writers that Gas was and what a lot of writers kind of aspire to, uh, don't think about the reader. They, they write what they want to write on the page. They, their, their fidelity is with whatever text they're, they're in the process of creating, and that's their only concern. And then once it's out there, readers can take it or they can leave it. But there it is, right? Um, now, obviously, this is all kind of working, you know, against that traditional model. You know, I mentioned before that, you know, from a from Foucault's standpoint, the the literary tradition um, is, is a power dynamic, and it, it's to keep certain kinds of uh, you know, narratives and certain kinds of writers of narratives in sort of the, the power dynamic, and then it sort of excludes other writers and so forth. Um, I, I didn't mention what probably is the best example of that, which is the, the literary agent, you know, kind of a layer of all that, right? So when, when a writer submits a, a novel looking for representation, what, what agents are doing almost always is comparing that novel against tradition. You know, if it's supposed to be a thriller, then they have certain expectations about what a thriller is, how it operates, and they're comparing your book that you've sent them to this traditional thriller model, whether it's a, you know, romance or whether it's a novel or, or whatever it might be, they have a particular model in mind that they are comparing it against. And if it doesn't fit that model, then it probably will be rejected and not represented and so forth. Right. And so um, this idea that, um, you know, if we're trying to write for someone to please someone's aesthetic, uh, 
then we're not doing the kind of writing that what gas is talking about here. All right, and um, just, a, just a bit more here. Uh, he talks about inspiration and where does that come from? How does he come up with ideas for his stories and for his novels and, and so forth? He says, um, I am exposing a symbolic center, he says. When I think the exposure is complete, I have finished with the story. It's more than peeling a peach. So <clears throat> there's a certain sort of idea, a, a, a sort of symbolic center, as he calls it, that he is working with. And when he kind of peels away the various layers and, and, and ends up there at the center uh, that he's trying to get to and he's been writing about the whole time, then it's over. It's finished. That's very you know, contradictory to the beginning, middle, end, Aristotelian model, you know, conflict, resolution, denouement kind of thing, right? And if we think about the, uh, the stories that we've been reading, some of them, especially in that first grouping that I gave you, there is a sense of beginning, middle, and end in a fairly traditional way. But um, in this last grouping of stories, and then certainly in the next group that we're in the, just about to read, or maybe have started reading some of us, um, is very difficult to, to identify anything that seems like a beginning, a middle, and an end, other than just you know, physically on the page, or this is the beginning of it, this is the middle of it, and this is the end of it. In terms of that conflict resolution denouement cycle, very difficult to, to identify, and that's because it's probably not there, right? So what, what these writers are doing is they're trying to get at an idea or, or an emotion um, and not resolve some conflict that human characters or a human character um, has been given on the first page, maybe the first sentence of the narrative, right? So it's a very different sort of approach to, to writing. And he goes on to say, uh, Gas, if I try to think out in outline some linear structure, then I start pushing my material in that direction like a baby in a pram. When you arrive at your destination, all you still have is a baby in a pram. I want the work to write itself, every passage to emerge from the ones that have come before. So I have to keep looking at what I've done to see what will come out. Usually nothing does, and I have to rewrite my beginning until something does suggest itself. All right. So again, um, he doesn't do, didn't do an outline first, you know, have a sort of structure in mind and then try to fit a story of some sort into that structure but rather start sort of experimenting, playing with language, with ideas, and then some sort of a, a story and a structure kind of emerges from that. It's a much more, um, I don't know, risky way of writing, I think. Um, ironically, perhaps, um, it might seem, that with my pushing the idea of experimental writing and, and you know, always thinking outside the box and, and so forth and so on. One of the things I do do as a writer is I write poetry. And uh, specifically for the last several years, the only kind of poetry I write is the sonnet and specifically the Petrarchan sonnet. And so I enjoy sonnet writing because of the fixed form. I like that I'm not trying to invent some form. I'm taking a, you know, a form that goes back hundreds of years and I am trying to capture some idea, some, some, some emotion uh, within this very fixed form following a very fixed structure. Again, the Petrarchan sonnet, octave and a sestet and all that business. Um, and so I like to sort of take a break from my prose writing, which is so sort of inch by inch, organic, feeling my way along, you know, not being sure where I'm going, what's happening, and so forth, which I, I do obviously enjoy in many ways, but it's nice to try kind of take a break from time to time and do something much more structured and much more fixed, uh, like writing a Petrarchan sonnet. 
All right. So I think both can have their appeal. And obviously there are a lot of writers and very successful writers who like, you know, having a particular structure, you know, a very traditional structure in mind and following it and, you know, step by step by step and arriving at a short story or a novel or whatever it may be. And that's fine. You know, if that is, you know, scratching your creative itch, then great. But for a lot of writers, they need some something more maybe uh, challenging. That's maybe not the right word, but but something riskier, more more of an adrenaline rush, you know, to trying to figure out how to put the story together. What is the story? You know, what's it going to look like and those kinds of things. Right. So um, I'll just kind of stop there. I'd be interested to know what you have to uh, say about this idea that uh, character can basically be anything, not just a human or, or human like character in a story, but rather an idea, an image, you know, an inanimate object, whatever, whatever it might be. Um, also, this idea of um, letting the, uh, the narrative and the narrative style kind of grow out of the subject matter itself. All right. So I uh, will look forward to hearing what you have to say on all that sort of thing. And I will see you down the digital road.